All right, it's Friday Q&A live, and I'm joined with the Marshall Twins. I've got Mary and Rose today. We are going to do a full hour, and then we're going to Blaze's birthday party. He's turning 12. Got a big day ahead of us. So, Mary Claire, welcome. Thank you for having me on. And Rose, welcome. Thank you. And we have a bunch of good questions that we're going to talk about today on the live Q&A. We will dip into your questions directly as we move along, especially as it relates. And I'm going to task Rose and Mary to be on the ball with that. So let me put up the, Q, the live Q&A info going on here. All right. A blessed Friday to everyone. And let's start off with our lead question, ladies, shall we? Okay. Go ahead, Rose. Question number one is, do we worship Mary? Uh, some old English prayer, book, prayer books speak of worshiping Mary. Is this true? And what does that mean? Okay. This is good because lately there's been a little bit of a controversy on Twitter. And uh, people are saying, we do worship Mary. Or other people say, we don't worship Mary. And the confusion is, as in the question, there are old theological books in English that speak of the worship of Mary. Now, we have to break into Greek and Latin to clarify all of this. So are you all ready to go into the, the linguistic journey, ladies? Yes, do it. This is um, like in my big fat Greek wedding, where give me any word, and I will show you how that word comes from Greek. So today's First two words are, and I'm going to put them on the screen, Latria and Dulia. All right, there they are. Latria and Dulia. And Latria, let me get them right there. There we go. There they are. Latria is what is due to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It is the worship of the three persons and the one substance of the Holy Trinity. All three persons are consubstantial, as we learned in Catechism. So when we talk about idolatry, that is giving false adoration to idols. Dulia, on the other hand, it means service. And this is the form of reverence that we give to our parents, to the Bible, to crosses, to crucifixes, to images of Jesus, this, uh, Our Lady, the saints, and that we give to the saints and to relics. Mm -hmm. So this is the veneration. So I'm going to add that to our definition for everyone here. Does the Go word dulia relate to doula as in like service to the mother or is that different? I think it does. Okay. I think a doula, I, I'm not sure. Maybe there's some, some doulas today on the live chat. All right, so Latria is the worship due to God alone. Mm -hmm. And Dulia is worship due to um, created things. Things or people. Oh my goodness, that's a bad, bad graphic there. So let's okay. fix that. All right. So, ladies, I'm going to, I'm joined today by my beautiful daughters, Mary and Rose. I'm going to ask, I'm going to throw out some things here, and I want you to tell me, Dulia or Latria? Okay. Okay, we're going to play the Dulia or Latria game. Okay. What does Latria mean, like, um, just like the word itself? Plain, plain worship. Name. Worship. It means worship. Okay. And see, here's, see, so we're it, going down this trail. Do we worship Mary? No. There's, well, see, it depends on what you're talking about. Like there's two words, and actually Mary gets hyperdulia. There's two words for worship in the in the Greek language. Right. In the English language, it gets a little bit complicated. We're gonna do Greek first, then we're gonna do Latin, and then we're gonna do English. Okay. So I want everybody. Okay, so Dulia or Latria? God the Holy Ghost. Latria. Latria. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, a relic of Saint Stephen. Dulia. Dulia. Very good. Uh, an icon of St. John the Baptist. Dulia. 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 Good. Um, I'm going to give you something hard now. The Eucharist. 
Latria. Latria. Is well, it wait, Dulia wait, 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 wait. or Latria? See, I'm going to get wait, you here. Is it consecrated? Yeah, yeah. It's consecrated. consecrated. Yeah. <laughs> the Eucharist, consecrated. Then, Dulia or Latria? Latria. Audience, what do you say? The answer is Latria. I turned that down. That, that effect has been really loud and it makes people upset, especially when they listen to the audio. The Eucharist receives Latria because the Eucharist is Jesus Christ. Now, when it comes to Mary... There is a special category. Do you girls know what it is? Mm, hyper. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's correct. Mary receives a hyperdulia, right? She receives mm -hmm. the highest form of dulia. Right? So she gets the highest. Okay. Why? Because she's the highest created person, place, or thing. So Mary receives the highest form of dulia. Mm -hmm. Now, also in Latin is another word that I'm going to add in here, and that is the word cultus. Cultus means worship. All right. So we often talk about the cult of the saints. That could be translated as the worship of the saints. And what does the word worship means? mean? It means worth, ship, worthiness is what it means. So you girls maybe don't know this, but your mom and I were married in the Episcopal Church. And in our vows, your mom had to say to me and I had to say her to her, um, with my body, I thee worship. Is that in the Catholic vows? I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> this was Anglican. This is Episcopalian. 1928 Book of Common Prayer is how we were married. That was part of our vows. It wasn't the only vow. But with my body, I thee worship. That is, with my body, I show thee the worthiness, the respect, mm -hmm. the veneration, right, with the body. That was part of it. So as you can see, the word worthy, if worship comes from the word worthy, well, you can talk about how humans or Bibles or crucifixes are worthy of veneration. And that's where the confusion comes in. So these are our Greek words. I'm going to set the Greek words aside. And now we're going to do the Latin words. All right. The Latin words are adorate, adoratio. Of course, it wants to spell check me. Adoratio for... Latria to God and veneratia, of course, you want to spell check me for dulia to creatures. And I got away from myself because cultus is actually Latin. right. So now I have to go over here and change this, this one over here because I put cultus over here. Confusing people. Okay. There we go. Okay, so technically, in Latin, adoratio is only for the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost. And you would speak of Eucharistic veneration or Eucharistic adoration. Oh. What's the difference? What, what would... No, I mean, which, which is the right word? Oh, adoration. Oh, adoration. adoration. You don't go to Eucharistic veneration, you go to Eucharist adoration because adoration is the Latin word that corresponds to latria. Mm -hmm. And veneratio is the Latin word that corresponds to dulia. Right. Then the confusing part is we also have cultus in Latin, which means to worship. Mm -hmm. So technically, in a, in a sense, we do, in English, worship Mary, but we worship <laughs> her with hyperdulia. They're going to cut that out and... Oh, I know. People are gonna <laughs> people are gonna come in here and they're gonna splice that out, right? But when it comes to Latria, that which is due to God, the adoration, Mary never gets that and never should get that. Okay. All right. This is why when you read old English texts, sometimes they will always use adoratio, adoration in English for God. Like we adore God. Right. At the Mass, we adore God. When we kneel down before the Eucharist, we adore the Eucharist, Eucharistic adoration, mm -hmm. right? And then they will use veneration and sometimes worship for the saints, the angels, etc. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. because they're not because worship doesn't have any direct relationship to either Greek or to Latin. Whereas adoratio has adoration and veneratio has veneration and even latria has idolatry. Right. Right. So that's why we have all this misunderstanding. So when you're talking to non-Catholics, you have to explain to them, there are two ways of showing veneration or worship towards a created person Mm -hmm. or thing and to God. And we Catholics have a hard line, a chasm between those two. And that's, that's that. What's the, where does the word worship come from? Worth, worth. Okay. Take the word so worship. Germanic or? Yeah. So worth, mm-hmm. some, like this is worth $5. Yeah. Or you are worthy to have this job. Or you are worth it. Right. So you mm-hmm. take worth and you add ship to it. So in English, that's like adding ness or like, like your lordship. Right. Mm-hmm. So we, that means your lordliness. Right. right. So when you say, your worship, you're saying your worthiness. So you're saying you're a worthy person. That's where we get the word worship or worship. Mm-hmm. All right. Did we did we cover that? I'm going to go into the live chat real quick. Hey, everybody yeah. in the live chat. What's going on? Y'all got any comments, questions, clarifications that you need? English is just a bastardization version of Latin. Not really. It's got this whole Germanic, Mm -hmm. French, all kinds of things going in there. Kennedy Report's got the OBS expert going on. Kennedy Hall, what's going on? And people are asking, would Trump get Dulia? St. Michael get Dulia? Yeah, so St. Michael would get Dulia. And then on a lower level, we would we would give Dulia to civic leaders and to our parents. Mm-hmm. So y'all should give me some Dulia. <laughs> Just filial, saying. Filial piety. A little, little Dulia. Yeah, filial piety. Need a little bit of Dulia. Okay. Very good. Let's move on to our next question. <clears throat> Where is confession in the Bible? Where is confession in the Bible? You want to go to John 20, 22 and 23. This is the first resurrection Sunday. Christ has risen from the dead and he breathes on the apostles and says, receive the Holy Ghost. If any, if you forgive the sins of any, their sins are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, their sins are retained. Y'all have that in the Bible? Or you can hand me the Bible and I'll read it. Cue it up. One John? Uh, Not one John, Gospel of John. Also implicit in uh, Matthew 16, the binding of the keys is the jurisdiction of Peter over the church. And that jurisdiction is participated in by the bishops and the priests. Uh, Matthew 18, 18, where you have Christ tell the apostles that they have the power to bind and loose. 2 Corinthians 5.18, Paul says he has the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation is administering the sacrament of reconciliation or penance. You got John 20.22? Mm. There it is. You want me to read it? Here it is. And when Jesus has said this, he breathed on them, and he said to them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. And whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. End quote. Now, did... Jesus give the ability to read minds to the 12 apostles? No. No. So the only way that they could forgive sins is how? Confessing them. Words. Yeah. Someone, you would have to confess. If you want to be forgiven the sin of murder by one of the 12 apostles, you would have to go to one of the 12 apostles and say, hey, I need to talk to you. Mm-hmm. I murdered someone. I'm a Christian. I feel really bad about it. I repent. I need penance and absolution. And then the apostle discerning the contrition could forgive the sins. So the fact that Christ our Lord gives the power to forgive sins through the Holy Ghost, right. he Jesus actually breathes on them. And in the, in the ordination rite, traditionally, the bishop says to the priest, receive 
ye the Holy Ghost. So he mm-hmm. says the same exact words. Gives him the power. It has to be said aloud. Hmm? It has to be said aloud. What does? Like your sins. Yeah, your confessions. Or if you're if you can't speak sign language. Okay. Yeah. So this is funny we're talking about this. Um so I mean, I don't know anyone who does this, but um it's there are some like churches, like mega churches and stuff from like the people at my school go to. And it's a thing that like you confess your sins to like other people. It's like you have like a group and it's like mm-hmm. you just like do that. I don't know. Yes. Some weird churches around there, but so okay, so this is like they call it accountability partners. Okay, right? So they're like, man, I'm really struggling with pornography and I can't beat it. So I'm gonna get a group of other guys and we're gonna meet once a week and be like, how are you doing? I'm like, man, I failed, I failed, right? So evangelical non Catholics are already realizing that they need some way to get things off their chest. Mm-hmm to be held accountable and to try to progress in sanctity. Right. So in a way they're back engineering the sacrament of penance. <laughs> right? So um, would that be considered a sin or just like not valid confession? Or is it like confessing your sins? Well, I think it's good. Here? So um, if you got the Bible, go to James chapter five and James actually discusses this, the apostle James. While you do that, I'm going to run in here to the, Comments and questions. Matt McCulloch says, Dr. Marshall, I saw on LifeSite News that you are running for president. Is this true? It is true. I am running for president. And uh, I'll be talking more about that in the next week. I thought about doing a big announcement today, but we already had the live Q&A set up. And we're doing the live Q&A. This but trumps the presidential election. I am... Yes, this show, Trump, <laughs> this show right now that we're doing trumps the discussion Family on man. the me running for president. But I am running for president. Yes, I am. Okay, we got James? Nope. Let me help you. Table of contents are checked. See, I raised you as a cradle Catholic, so you're having problems. <laughs> having problems looking <laughs> up the Bible. I knew it was Bible. in the back, but it was it's too small. <laughs> Converts put us to shame. They in the back, <laughs> in the back of the Bible is what we call in the New Testament. No, but after the gospel. <laughs> yes. You were close. You were close. All right. James chapter 5, verse 14. This is a small book. I know, right? Oh, sorry, 16. Confess therefore your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be saved. For the continual prayer of a just man availeth much. So here he says, confess your sins one to another. So there is something commendable. Mm-hmm. of confessing your sins to one another and praying for one another. And that's kind of like, man, I am really failing in this part of my Christian walk. You say it to another person, mm-hmm. will you please pray for me? That's actually in the Bible. Now, what's interesting about this section is that's verse 16. In verse 14 of James 5, it says, Is any man among you sick? Let him bring in the priests of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. What sacrament is that? Baptism. No. What? What? Confirmation. No. Oil. It's no. Is any man sick? <laughs> oh, oh, anointing of the sick. Yeah, anointing of the sick. Oil. Yeah, <laughs> anointing of the sick. Yeah. Is any man among you sick? Let him call on the priests and let him pray over him, anointing him with oil. So this is the sacrament of extreme oh, unction. Sick. I think even looks like spiritually. Oh no, this is actually sick, right? So here in the context of confessing your sins is also bringing in the priest. So I think we can infer from this. Ultimately, we to get absolution, you have to confess your sins to the priest. But in that context, we can also confess our sins one to another. Only one's valid, though. We're out of, we're out of focus. There it goes. All right. Yeah, only one. Well, only one would, would remit mortal sin, and that is yeah. priestly absolution from a real valid confession with the real mm-hmm. priest good all right let's go to another uh question all right okay um let's do okay if god told adam and eve be fruitful and multiply why does the catholic church have celibacy mm, good if god said be fruitful and multiply why isn't it disobedient 
If you're like, I want to be a nun and not be fruitful and multiply. That's all. In fact, Martin Luther used that argument against the Catholic Church. He said, you can't hold nuns and monks in vows of celibacy because they're against natural law. They're against the mandate that God gave to Adam. Mm -hmm. This is why Martin Luther, who had a vow of celibacy, married a nun who had a vow of celibacy and they had kids. Major mortal sins there, right? Well, the commandment by God to be fruitful, multiply was not universal. For example, Jeremiah the prophet, who's one of the holiest people in the Old Testament, he was sanctified in his mother's womb like John the Baptist. He was called to be celibate. He never married. So there's an example of someone in the Old Testament who's called by God to not marry and be celibate. So we know that there are exceptions even in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, we have many examples of celibate people. Paul. St. Paul. Now we know Peter was married, the first Pope. Paul was celibate. And he says, I wish all men were like me. Timothy was celibate. Titus was celibate. Luke was celibate. Mark was celibate. The apostle John was celibate. So we already see in that first generation, there is this call for celibacy and it comes from Christ. Cause he says, some are made eunuchs by other men. Eunuchs means they lost their gonads. <laughs> It is, I mean, I guess you got to laugh. It's a bummer. Um, some are made eunuchs by other men, and some are made eunuchs voluntarily for the kingdom of God. So Jesus Christ is already setting out before the apostles, I am calling, God is calling some men to be eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven. And that call is not saying matrimony is bad or having children is bad. Matrimony is good. Having children procreating is good, just like eating food is good. If you don't eat food, you die. And yet, in the New Testament, God calls us to give up eating at certain times, which is good for the sake of the kingdom. And sometimes he calls people to give up matrimony and procreating for the sake of the kingdom because matrimony is good. St. John Chrysostom said, celibacy is only honored because matrimony is such a high calling. Celibacy is even higher calling. Mm -hmm. but you're giving up something for the kingdom. And all of those things are being called to conformity to Jesus Christ, who is married to the church and not to an earthly woman, right. despite the Da Vinci Code saying he's married to Mary Magdalene. Never finished that book. Yeah, yeah, it's bad. It's <laughs> bad. Okay, so uh, if you want to learn more about celibacy in the New Testament, I would encourage you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and that's where Paul talks about matrimony versus celibacy. It's in the New Testament. It's one of those chapters that Protestants never discuss because it's not part of their worldview, not part of their theology. But Paul very clearly has a celibacy path and a matrimony path. And he says the celibate path is the higher path. All right. Okay. I'm going to go into the life real quick, see what people are saying. Okay. All right. Levites had a wife, so should modern religious leaders. Well, here's the distinction. Uh, Levites and Old Testament priests still had to refrain from sexual intercourse while they served in the temple. So even in the Old Testament, liturgical service um, made it so that you could not, even though you're validly married and marriage is good, even so, while you did liturgical service, you could not enjoy the nuptial embrace. That's Old Testament teaching. So um, since in the New Testament, our priests are 24-7, daily mass, all that, it makes sense that our priests would not be married. And even Eastern priests, Eastern Catholic priests who are married, when they, they usually only say the Divine Liturgy, the Eucharist on Sundays, they still have to be continent, no sexual embrace with their wife from Vesper Saturday until Vesper Sunday. So they still have a window of continence. All right. That was a good comment. David, you should have warned us 30 minutes before when you were going live so we don't miss your lives. I apologize, David, but you can go back and watch, watch it when it's over. Watch the early part. Going back into a couple more questions here. Here's uh, Cooper. Cooper says, first time day, 
wife and I are having a girl advice or maybe ask your daughters advice for a baby girl. I don't know. Never raised one before. <laughs> Bap- step one, baptizer. <laughs> step one, baptizer. Step two, love her, care for her, give her everything she needs physically and emotionally, both mom and dad. She'll be mm-hmm. an amazing young lady like these young ladies. All right, next question. Wait, I'll pull it up. Um, does baptism save us, and what does it mean, and how do we do? How do we explain it to someone All right. who doesn't believe in it? Yeah, I tweeted this out earlier this week, and people got um confused. I said, "Does the Bible teach that baptism saves us?" And I can't remember the exact numbers, but I think it was like 20% of people said it doesn't save us. But the Bible says that baptism does save us. Is it a stepping stone? There's three of us here. I think there's, it doesn't know which eyes to pick on. It's just not focusing. There There it goes. There it is. We're in focus. So yeah, baptism saves us. And the Bible verse that I want you to look up here. You ready? (laughs) It's towards the back. It's in the new, (laughs) towards the back of the New Testament. It's it's first Peter chapter three, verse 21. There you go. You're on it. She's on it. 21. Okay. Read it into the mic. Yep. Okay. Verse 21. Wherein to baptism being of the like form, now saveth you also. Not the not the putting away of the filth of the, of the flesh, but the examination of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All right. Excellent. So baptism now saveth you. Yep. That's what it says. Also, yep. Yeah. Baptism saves you. Now, how do we understand that? Well, you have to understand causality. Think of the greatest violin player of all time. Where is the power to make the music? Where is it? Let's say we got the the most, the greatest violinist. Mm -hmm. Where is that? Where is, where is the power to be the greatest? Like the The willingness? Yeah. Where is it? It comes within. It's inside of him, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you took his violin, I'm sure it's like a really nice violin. And you like played it, put it on the table. You're like, wow, okay, let's hear it. Nothing would happen. Yeah. It's kind of like in that movie Spinal Tap <laughs> where he holds up that guitar and he's like, listen to the sustain. And he's like, I don't hear anything. He's like, well, you would, right? It's kind of like unless the violinist is actually connected to the violin, and with his fingers and the bow and all of his physical and mental energy being poured into the violin, no amazing violin music happens, right? Right. And it has to be that person. It can't be me. I can't pick the violin. Yeah, it has to be that person, right? (laughs) So in this scenario, the violin is the instrumental cause of the music. If you put the violin on the table, it doesn't do anything. But when you connect it with the master, it creates the amazing music. And so in Catholic theology, we understand the seven sacraments as the instrumental means of salvation. Right? Right. Right. So you can use all kinds of, like you could say, you know, here's the bow and arrow and here's the archer and there is the target, right? Mm -hmm. The instrumental means of getting the arrow into the bullseye is the Mm -hmm. but you have to have the archer with his training and his mind and his body and his whole skill set with the bow puts the arrow into the center of the target so we catholics is all very philosophical we catholics see baptism as the instrument of salvation okay it is the means by which jesus if you take the idea of a violin or a bow jesus takes that And as the instrument, he communicates sanctifying grace, righteousness, justification, sanctification, and he infuses faith, hope, and charity into the person 
through the instrumental means of baptism. So could someone like mistake this and be like, well, baptism, you're saved, once saved, always saved. So as you're baptized, then you're good for life. Like, yeah, that would be an error, right? So, so where, does, where, where does it like, where would you derive that you have to have all of them in communion to be saved? All what? All sacraments? sacraments. Well, you don't need all of them. You, technically, all, all you need is baptism. Unless you commit mortal sin, then you need well, yes. penance. But yeah, I mean, clearly, once you're baptized, you have to remain in him. Mm -hmm. As he says in John, abide in me and I abide in you, right? Those that don't abide are cast out. So there has to be the synergy and the connection, right, of, of uh, the believer and Christ. But the instrumental means of that connection is baptism. So baptism saves you, right? Just like you could say the violin made beautiful music. You could even respect and revere that violin. But ultimately, the power of the violin is rooted in the master. And that's how we see baptism. So like any water is, is water, but as soon, and I, when we get baptized liturgically, we have holy water. Yeah. But in an emergency, there could just be an Evian bottle with water in it, mm -hmm. right? And the person's dying, and they're like, baptize me. I believe in Christ. I was, I'm not baptized. And you could just pour water on their head and say, I baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, right? And it would be valid, even though it's just water and Evian, because that is now being as associated by the form of the sacrament which is the words of Christ to communicate salvation. So baptism does save you. Is it the source of your salvation? No. It's the no. beginning. No. Is it, is baptism without Jesus anything? No. Right. Other, I mean, you can't even say yeah. that because it's, <laughs> it's in the name of the father, the son, the Holy ghost. So if you didn't say that, it would be invalid baptism, but, Baptism is the instrumental means of our salvation. So baptism does save you. Right? Mm -hmm. Just like if you were drowning in the ocean and I had a, uh, what are those life rings called? Lifesavers. Life life, we'll call them lifesaver floats. And I say, catch, or I throw it. You're supposed to throw it behind the person mm -hmm. so you don't hit him in the face. I throw it to you and I pull you in. Who saved you? Me. Yeah. Right? But you could also say that float was a lifesaver, right? Right. Or I was saved by the float out in connection to me pulling you in, yeah. right? So there's an instrumental means of that salvation happening. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I think so. All right, let's jump into the comments real quick, see if anybody has some comments, some questions going on. Many people believe baptism alone saves. Exactly. That's not true. Baptism alone does not save. You have to persevere in your baptism. Now, if you're a baby and you get baptized and you die, you're saved because the instrumental means connected you to Jesus Christ. Going through here. Are Protestant baptisms valid? Let me just say, there are technically no Protestant baptisms. Do you know that? Mm -hmm. if, you, if a Protestant, if a Lutheran minister takes a baby and says, um, Peter, that's the baby's name, Peter, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If he says that, that's a valid baptism. There's only one baptism. Jesus didn't institute Protestant baptism and Catholic baptism and Eastern Orthodox baptism. There's only one baptism, and it's the Catholic baptism. That child received a Catholic baptism, not a Protestant baptism. No so I was baptized thing. Catholic. The baby is baptized Catholic. In fact, Plummer, in that manual over there, this is kind of scary when you think about it. He says that technically everyone who's baptized, including Protestants, are obliged to attend Mass every Sunday because that's what baptism does to you when you're at the age of reason. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of crazy to think mm -hmm. every validly baptized Protestant is obliged to attend Mass, which they're not doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wait, here's a uh, super chat. Oh, I answered that one. Is Holy Eucharist necessary for salvation? Um, 
if you consider Holy Eucharist as Jesus, yes. Is reception of Holy Communion necessary for salvation? Not necessarily, no. Anything y'all want to add to that, girls? Did, I might be wrong, but didn't, like, I guess a couple of centuries ago, it was irregular to receive every Sunday? Or like, yes. every time you went to Mass, it was, like, irregular? So Jerome... He says that the Eastern Christians in his day, so we're talking late 300s, mm -hmm. Jerome says that the Greek Christians were already receiving once a year. It's like they weren't worthy or? Yeah, they weren't they worthy. Prep. Now you have to remember in the early church and really up to 1950. Well, wasn't it harder to prepare for five, the reception of the Eucharist? Exactly. You had to Eucharist? fast from all food and water. You got up at 2 a.m. and had a, one sip of water, you could not have the Eucharist. If you read Thomas Aquinas in the 1200s, he says water breaks the fast. That's the ancient tradition. When did it water and medication, was it, when was it introduced? Um, that started happening, yeah, I believe, in the 1900s. Was medicine kind of accepted? I mean, I guess if you're on your deathbed. then in you, like, you're So if you're on your deathbed, you're exempt of the Eucharistic fast. Okay. So the famous story is Blessed Karl of Austria, the emperor, he was in his fever. He drank water after midnight because he was feverish and dying. And then they realized he was dying and they brought him the whole Eucharist and he objected and said, I can't receive because I drank water. And but then, it affected his and, salvation. Well, then the priest said, emperor, you're dying. Mm -hmm. You are exempt from the fast. And he received communion and died. Mm -hmm. So... If you, if everyone watching right now, if they're like, well, why wouldn't these Christians receive Holy Communion every single day and every single Sunday? If you had to fast from midnight into reception, and if you really want to be traditional and you read Thomas Aquinas, between married couples, no sexual relations from midnight until receiving communion. So from Saturday at midnight, no food, no water, anything until you receive communion, there would be a lot less people receiving communion. Yeah. And of course, and your whole, your whole family, if you have kids and everything, everyone has to be right. Everyone. Yeah. In fact, it used to be when it was time for first communions for kids, mm -hmm. the family would go to all the wells and faucets and tie a ribbon on them the night before the Holy communion, to first communion. Child. So that the child, it was like a ceremony for the child to realize you can't drink water or eat food until after you receive communion. So if they did wake up at night and go to the well or go to the faucet, there'd be a ribbon. They'd be like, oh, I can't eat, I can't drink. It's pretty intense. Yeah. I guess not. So nowadays some people will think it's like they stick out if they don't get up to receive, if they stay in their pew. Or, mm -hmm. like, do you think they feel pressure to just, or you think it was, it was a lot more common so that way it wasn't weird if you didn't receive. So there was a pope, I can't remember which one, who said, um, Ushers coming row to row mm -hmm. to like let people offer communion is condemned by a pope. I can't remember which pope it is. And he said it was because it encourages people to go to communion who shouldn't go to communion. Including Protestants and... Or just yeah. Catholics who are in mortal sin. Mm -hmm. We were abroad last summer and like we went to that parish and it was just... Madness. Mad it was chaos. So we went to St. <laughs> Nicholas, what's it called? De Chardonnay? I can't remember. Mm, I think so. Yeah, yeah, I think it is in Paris. Mm -hmm. And I it was a total they didn't have ushers and it was just a amorphous mob of people going to the just kneelers. wild going up to Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. And I remember you girls mentioning it to me and I was like that's actually the right way to do it even though it looks <laughs> crazy. Yeah. Um you should go up when you feel ready. There should not be an usher saying row A may now everyone in row A Everyone in row B, like getting on and off an airplane, it should not be like that. I gotta, to, I gotta look up what Pope that was. Is anyone in the live to, chat like, now? Finish mass on a certain time. They just exactly. So, like, how long would they have communion available then, until everybody's? Well, I mean, it's not just like, like take five minutes. I yeah. mean, you got to get up there. But yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. What's our next question? Oh, um, this is this is a good one. Is Getting drunk a sin and why? Is getting drunk a sin? Yes, getting drunk is a sin. It's a sin because God made you in his image. And by being in his image, it doesn't mean you have two eyes and nose and mouth, ears. 
In his image means you have an intellect and a will. You can think of things and you can make decisions that are moral or immoral. That's what it means to be in God's image. You have a free will. When you do drugs or get drunk, what happens? You lose your your sense, your cognition. You lose your cognition. What about your free will, your ability to make choices? You lose control of what other people do to you and what you do to other people. Yeah, you yeah. lose control. Yeah. Like people are like, I was drunk. I can't believe I did that or it doesn't count because I was drunk or whatever. Like everyone agrees getting drunk impedes your free will and it impedes your intellect. And the same goes for hypnosis, right? Same goes for hypnosis. Good call. Good call. Small, smart girls. <laughs> So if you're willingly doing that, it's a sin. You're basically saying, here's my intellect and here's my free will that God gave me and here's the knob and I'm going to either mute it or turn it down, 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 down. Mm -hmm. It's the greatest, other than salvation, it's the greatest gift that God gave you on a natural order and you're you're shutting it off Mm -hmm. or muting it. That's a sin. So you can't do it. Um, Some verses for this. Um, Proverbs 20, verse 1, wine is a mocker. Wine mocks you when you get drunk. Isaiah 5.11 says, woe to those addicted to alcohol. In the Old Testament, woe means like cursed or anathema. Isaiah 5.22, woe to those who are heroes of drinking wine. So like you think about like, taking shots, who can take the most shots, who can drink the most wine. If you're good at that, you're a hero at that. Whoa. Uh, Ephesians 5.18 says, do not get drunk. That's New Testament. Do not get drunk. And then in Romans, Galatians, and 1 Peter, it says drunkenness is condemned as sinful. It's listed uh, listed in the list of mortal sins. So a lot of people are like, being a sodomite, you're going to hell, burning hell, and then they get drunk. You're going to go to hell with the sodomites. Or those girls are a bunch of whores. They're going to go to hell. Sodomites are going to hell. Idolaters are going to hell. And then they get drunk. You're going to hell. Drunkenness is in the same list as all those sexual okay. sins. So, is it related to gluttony in any way? Or yeah, different? it's a okay. subset of gluttony. But... It's a serious mortal sin, and I think we have this idea in Catholicism. Maybe it's our Irish tradition. Y'all are both wearing your Irish green today. Um, Yeah, we Catholics get wasted. It's awesome. It's fun. No, it's a mortal sin. You can't get wasted. No bueno. It's bad. St. Patrick's Day kind of. Getting wasted on St. Patrick's Day is degenerate and cringe, and you shouldn't do it. Get drunk on a saint's day? Do you really think St. Patrick, the Bishop of Ireland, is like, yeah, go get wasted and act like a monkey on my feast day? No. No way. All right, I'm going to look at some comments and questions here. Do y'all see anything that stands out? Is purposefully getting buzzed a venial sin? What do you girls think? Well, is... Or do the different levels of drunkenness fall into the different categories of sin, like venial or mortal, or is it just mortal? Well, it's kind of like if I steal 50 cents from you or I steal 50 million. Right. 50 still- million is a mortal sin. 50 cents is oh. a venial sin. So let's talk about getting buzzed. Hmm. What do y'all think? I, so I so it's what we got to do. Just because it's different for everybody and it's, you don't, sometimes it's like, also it's drunkenness. It's hard to gauge that unless you're an experienced drinker. Yeah. So we have to define what buzzed is. See, if you want to be a good Thomist, a disciple of Thomas Aquinas, Mm -hmm. you never really answer any question ever (laughs) before you say, let us make at least two distinctions. You always got to lead in with that. All right. So let's make some distinctions here. There is drunk. That is where your intellect and will are impeded. Mm -hmm. Certainly, if you cannot operate a vehicle, you are drunk. Right? Yeah. 
if you can't walk, you are drunk. What else would be there? If you're sick. If you're sick. Well, maybe not. I mean, some people oh, yeah, might guess. just have a beer and it upsets their tummy and they throw up, but they're not drunk. Right. right? Blackout. Blackout drunk. Yeah. I mean, you're drunk. Um, okay. Everybody knows what drunk Yeah. Is. All right. What's below that is what I call Mary of Heart. And by Mary, I'm saying M-E-R-R-Y, like Merry Christmas, not the Virgin Mary. And the Bible commends that. You can be Mary of Heart. It's Easter Sunday. You have some wine with your dinner. The wine kind of relaxes you. You're, you're having a good time. You know, like Jesus turned water into wine at the wedding at Cana. It's, you're having some champagne at a wedding. Like these sort of things do increase your enjoyment. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. You're on a pilgrimage. We're going to Chartres a little bit. It's going to be fun. You're on a pilgrimage. You finally get there and you have a beer or whatever. And you're like, we made it. Praise God. And you, it's a celebration. Right? Mm-hmm. So that's fine. I think what we have to find here, find out here is what is getting buzz. Because I know there's people who getting <laughs> sloshed is getting buzz for them. <laughs> right? Like, right. I'm just buzzed. And they're just, they're sloshed. Right. Whereas other people would maybe qualify Mary of heart having a couple drinks. They, they might call that buzzed. Right. But so if the you're... Symptoms vary. Exactly. So I think we need to make that distinction. Okay, don't extrapolate from this question, but is like, could you... Because then, then you could use the argument like that, um, like marijuana isn't just not a drug because it relaxes you. Would you say marijuana is a sin? Well, I've never done marijuana. Um, I've done alcohol. You do alcohol. I've, I've done alcohol. Um, so I've never done marijuana, but I've talked to a lot of people who have, and I've studied it. And my understanding is, and then I, I also had a very dear friend uh, die of cancer, could not eat food, and had to take THC daily. Well, not medicinal, but like... No, but he got high. Leisure. No, I mean, like, he got high, so I asked him. He's a traditional... Okay. Latin mass okay. Catholic who's taking THC daily prescribed. And I was just, so he's not a druggie. Right. He's not like going to Grateful Dead shows. He's, but he is getting high. So I wanted, I asked him because he's a devout man. What's it like? You know, is it like alcohol, whatever it is, you know? And I, from what I can tell, um, it's all kind of depend there. See, before when it was just smoking joints, people were getting high. But now that there's like edibles in the, the micro dosing where they can take just a little bit, maybe to hold their food down, mm-hmm. the, the narcotic or getting high effect actually can be quite low on the THC. So I don't really know. I need to do more studies, but, but getting high on marijuana is a sin. That's been a teaching. No, I mean, it does distort your judgment. Yeah. I mean, it's, if it's impeding your intellect and your will, it, it's getting high. You're, you're falling into that intoxication. So, um, there you go. Any other comments or questions here we want to? Are you a dead Where head? does the church stand on medical use? I think perfectly allowed. Yeah. I mean, if I were dying of cancer right now, God forbid, and I couldn't hold food down and I was losing weight week after week after week, you better believe that if I could somehow use THC to help me in that, I would do it. And it wouldn't be a sin. So... But I've never done marijuana, Mary Jane. <sighs> Where are we on time? We're coming to um, an end here. 48 minutes. You got another question? Uh, let's do one more. All right. Is the Holy Spirit, would you refer to the Holy Spirit as a he or it? Ooh, now we're talking about the pronouns of God. Have you ever noticed that all these liberal people are like, respect my pronouns, respect my pronouns. You misgendered me and like crying on TikTok and Instagram, like crying, like, oh. have you seen this? Mm-hmm. Melting down, they got misgendered. And yet these same people are out there misgendering God, calling God a she. Mm-hmm. God refers to himself thousands of times in the Bible, thousands. And 100% of the time he identifies himself as he, him, every time he, him, 
People who are all God is a she, her, they are misgendering God. That's a crime. God is he. The father, fathers are he's. The son, sons are he, him. We also know that Christ was circumcised on the eighth day. Yet again, he, him. What about the Holy Spirit? Are spirits he, him? Are spirits it's? Well, we refer, we refer to angels as he, him. Correct. So it's kind of in the same way. Does that make yes. any sense? Yes. Angels are he, him. The Father, the Son are he, him. And the Holy Ghost is he, him. So let's go to John 14, 26. We should time you every time. Yes. Mary's, <laughs> Mary's having to do a lot of work. John 14, 26. Okay. I think right, this is go. the right verse. All right, so... But the paraclete, the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name... He will teach you all things. That settles it. The second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, refers directly to the third person of the Trinity, which he identifies as the paraclete, the Holy Ghost. He will teach you all things. So, it is taught infallibly by Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that the Holy Spirit is a he. So, to refer to the Holy Spirit as she, which some people do, even in conservative Catholic circles. Can you imagine? I expect it. I've she seen a lot of people sounds... saying, oh, like, I don't know if you've seen these on TikTok, like, proof God is a woman. Just kind of like in a way, like, women are in a divine, like, they refer to, like, women as, like, divinity by saying, oh, God like, is I'm a woman. Diva. It's like music. Yeah. Or, like, in music. There's, like, a, there's a song called God is a Woman. Yeah. And it, like, I That's mean, heretical. Yeah. So even at, I mean, this is of course lowercase g stuff, so not right. actually Christian. Right, right. But what about what about referring to the Holy Spirit as an it? That's more excusable than is it? She. No, it's not. It's I more, don't think so. But if you didn't know, if you didn't know this, Mary, you're just like it'd be they them then. They them. <laughs> <laughs> so no, think, think about it. Okay, so here, so what? What's more heretical, she or it? Well, she just sounds spiteful. Thanks, she. Yeah, you're being a f feminist, right? But it, or but it, you're denying the personhood of G of the Holy Spirit. I don't think. Like this, this can isn't it. I wouldn't say he or she on it's this. Like I would someone say it. Saying, That's I mean, like referring to like your baby. Like how old is it? People say well, this sometimes. Like, are you retarded? Example, like, well, then that, then like, okay, well, someone asked it, me, would you rather be referred to a he or an it? I'd say. I wouldn't say it because that dehumanizes yeah, you. Yeah, it. But him is well, less. It, I might be less. It depersonalizes actually. the Holy Spirit. So saying it about the Holy Spirit is heretical. Okay. And saying she. So you have to say he. So in the Holy Trinity, the Holy Trinity is a he, a he, and a he. The Father is a he, the Son is a he, and the Holy Ghost is a he. Here is one reason why it's really, really important. These feminazi theologians say the Holy Spirit is a she, even though Jesus said it's a he. Why do they say that? Because they want the incarnation of Jesus to be lesbian. The Holy Spirit, even though there was no sexual interaction between God and the Virgin Mary, she's a virgin, they want the Holy Spirit to be female. So it's like a female impregnating a female like in this weird trans thing. This is what these liberal theologians like Protestant seminaries teach. But sketch. Okay. But even if the Holy Spirit, okay. So the Holy Spirit is a he, as we know, he didn't impregnate Mary. Well, he, he, she and conceived Carmen, yeah. of the Holy ghost. So there was no sperm. Right. What, what normally would be, on a natural level, the father's sperm, his seed, in this supernatural miracle of the incarnation of Christ, she conceived of the Holy Ghost, as we say in the creed. Mm -hmm. So 
it is a male generative, a supernatural male conception. I mean, she conceives, right? right. But the, the power of conception comes from he, the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? And also, you know, in the Catholic tradition, we refer to Mary as the mother of God the Son, the adopted daughter of God the Father, and the spouse of the Holy Spirit because she's the Immaculate Conception. Well, how can the Holy Spirit be her spouse if the Holy Spirit is a she? Again, you got these feminist theologians wanting to do all this lesbianism and the divine economy, and it's gross. Does the Holy Spirit ever take the appearance of a male in the Bible, or is it like... So there's the famous image, uh, that Greek, Greek Orthodox icon of the Trinity. And here, let me see if I can find it. And it's the three men, so-called. You recognize yeah. this? Yes, I do. It's, it's the three men, so-called, who visit Abraham. It's by, um, is it Andre Rublev? Yeah, Rublev. I'm going to bring it up on the show for us. You got to screen capture it. Screen capture. Bring it in on the show. I need a producer. By the way, I'm hiring. Have I told you girls this? I am hiring... I need a video producer who will sit here and run everything. And I'm hiring. Um, that position is on, I think it's catholicjobs.com. If you want to apply, read the description and apply. Okay, here's the icon. All right, these are the three men, angels who visited Abraham. And the one in the middle is in the Eastern Orthodox clothing of Christ, the red with the blue over. The one on the left is supposed to be God the Father, and the one on the right signifies the Holy Spirit, blue and green. Where does the depiction of the Holy Spirit being a dove come from? Is that well, when Christ was baptized, the Holy Spirit came down like oh, a dove, dove on him. <laughs> All right, that's an hour, my friends. Let's go into the comments and the questions, see what you guys are saying. The church is the bride of what religion do you follow? I am Catholic. Like to use man generically, not person. Yeah, but that you have to be careful on that because when you're talking about the three persons of the Trinity, we're not talking about three men. The Catholic way is saying three persons. So in theology, we just have to be careful with that. Um, are you really running for president? Yes, I really am running for president. Uh, here's an interesting fact. THC, which is the active element in marijuana, increases the chance of causing schizophrenia in boys by 30%. I don't doubt it. I mean, you're, you're the young adolescent mind is forming. We don't need to be putting drugs into it. Should Oh, should I renounce college fraternity membership? That's a big, especially some fraternities are associated with the Freemasons. You got to look that up. It depends on the kind of fraternity. It depends on the fraternity. Like pre-professional, yeah. I'd say is fine. Yeah. Cool. Or mom. All right. So I know a seminarian who was in a fraternity. Oh. Yeah. They, was that a problem? No, he said that he, It was checked out. It was not a Freemason. Well, I don't know if it is or not, but. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. All right. Okay, let's uh, let's let's pray the Our Father in Latin. Oremus nomini patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Amen. Pater noster, qui es in celi, sanctificetur nomen tuum. Adveniat regnum, regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, secret in cello et in terra. Panum nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie, et dimite nobis debita nostra. Sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, se libera nos amalo. Amen. Nomini Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. All right, everybody, thanks for watching. I just want to remind everybody we are doing the summer enrollment at NSTI, New St. Thomas Institute. You can get all 10 courses. Become a confident Catholic. You can take my course on the Old Testament and my course on the New Testament. 
and you will become fluent, not just conversant, you will become fluent in the Catholic Bible and understanding Catholic theology from a biblical point of view. I'll also give you my Catholic Bible cheat sheet, how to read the Bible in a year, and all other nine courses, including my course on the Latin Mass, philosophy, apologetics, and et cetera. So sign up at nsti.com. Tons of people have been signing up the last few days. Enrollment is open. Do not miss it. nsti.com. Start taking online classes today. If you want to move to a different part of the country and you need help, you need a pro-life real estate agent who can help you relocate, go to realestateforlife.org. They'll connect you. Let them know you heard about it on the Dr. Taylor Marshall podcast. Also, don't forget to pick up a copy of Infiltration, my best-selling book. If you want a signed copy, you can go right here, patreon.com forward slash DR Taylor Marshall. You can get rosary, signed books, everything over at Patreon. And you support this channel and support our family and what we're trying to accomplish. So you can go to patreon.com forward slash DR Taylor Marshall. Anything you want to talk about, ladies, before we head off? No. No, no, we're good. Covers it. Have a good summer. Have a good summer. Are y'all going to come back and do this again with me this summer? Yeah. Yeah. Before yeah. we talk about some questions. Okay, good. All right, friends. Thanks for watching. Remember our Lord Jesus Christ is you're the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. God bless and Godspeed.